Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Georgetown University, to the Lowinger Library. My name is Artemis Kirk, University Librarian, and it's a great pleasure to have all of you here with such a distinguished panel. This program tonight is a presentation of the art unit of the Booth Family Center for Special Collections in conjunction with the Washington Print Club and the Washington Printmakers Gallery. The talk um, is accompanying a wonderful exhibition that you will see outside a bit later, Color in Relief, curated by, where did she go? Lulan Walker, art curator, and Kristen Runge, assistant art curator, both members of the Booth Family Center for Special Collections, and the director of the Booth Center, John Buchdahl, who is hiding in the back of the room. We have a wonderful set of panelists. You probably know them well, well because of their stellar reputation, so let me welcome all of you, and I will introduce you very, very briefly. Our panelists are Ms. Ingrid Rose, conservator of works on paper, who published the catalogue raisonné of artist Bernard Drews's print oeuvre in 1984. Ms. Karen Drews Seibert, granddaughter of Werner Drews, and the representative of his estate. Mr. James Gross, an artist and educator whose works are in many prestigious galleries and museums around the world, including the Smithsonian in DC, the Museum of Modern Art, and the Guggenheim Museum in New York City, and the British Museum. Ms. Terry Parmalee, artist and printmaker who has generously donated more than 50 of her own prints to the Booth Family Center for Special Collections in this library. And Dr. Joanne Moser, who has held the position of Senior Curator Emerita at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Following this talk and panel presentation, I invite you to view the exhibition and to join us afterward for a reception. I want to thank again Lulen Walker and Kristen Rungi and John Buchtel for their putting together this program. And I especially want to thank Emily Minton, who is the library's programming and events coordinator, who put together the whole program, Mike Madison, and Amy Richards, who are taping and recording this program as well. So, without further ado, our panelists, please. I was invited to participate in this panel, and Lou Len was generous enough to say, talk about whatever you want. <laughs> it doesn't have to be about the show. It can be anything to do with the good cut. And so I chose to bring it as up to date as I could with some recent woodcuts from the 21st century, because this beautiful exhibition that she organized doesn't quite get into the 21st century, at least in any major way, so I thought I would do it with some slides. So, I decided to call my little talk, The Woodcut is Alive and Well in 20th Century, 21st Century, because indeed it is, and there's some wonderful works being uh, made. And I decided to choose three of my favorite artists and show you some of their images and tell you a little bit about them. She has us on a very strict schedule, 10 minutes max. So if you will excuse me, I'm going to stay very close to my notes. Otherwise, we'll be here all evening if I just talk. And then we can talk afterwards. So, in the late 1970s, Karen Kuntz uh, came on the printmaking horizon like a blazing fireball. She earned her master's degree from Ohio State University and has taught printmaking for several decades at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. What originally fascinated people with Karen's work, with, uh, work and continues to amaze them today is not only their enormity of scale, now this is not a big one, I have, well this is another small one, wow, I have another, here. Some of them are big, this is a book, and the last one I think is, huh, I chose all the slides of small. Well some of them are really enormous, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, let's see. Uh, their enormity of scale, but the color and complexity of her visual, of her imagery, visually connecting her prints with other media, especially painting. The delicacy and refinement of her woodblock printing recalls the long tradition of Japanese printmaking, though she uses oil-based inks rather than the water-based inks of Japanese ukiyo-e prints. Her prints are executed in a color reduction process using only one or two blocks. Each block is carved 
between runs. So the blocks are destroyed as the edition is printed. Kunz's painterly approach swings joyously to the other side of the art print pendulum, where her work breaks away from the flat, grained look of a traditional woodcut. There are references to landscape and what one would find living in Nebraska, the wide open ranges and amazing cumulus displays of clouds. Uh, she, there's also an observance of nature and its natural erosion and decay. She brings vibrant color to her work that is well above the register usually seen in this genre. And her ambitiously layered feast makes us forget the labored journey she makes in creating these final images. Her production level is equally ambitious, including her eloquent handmade books and mixed media work. And here I'm showing you one of her handmade books. It's a folded book. And even though the individual panels are small, it's really quite a large work when it is unfolded. So, on schedule here. The next artist I'd like to talk about is Martin Purdue. Now some of you, hopefully most of you, have had the opportunity to see his work. There was an exhibition earlier this year at the Smithsonian American Art Museum that was both sculpture and prints. And several years ago, there was a major sculpture retrospective at the National Gallery. So I hope you're familiar with his work. He is a native Washingtonian, so you especially should know his work. Perrier is a leading American sculptor and printmaker. Born in Washington, D.C., 1941, Perrier read Kane, which is the portfolio that this is work is part of. He read Kane for the first time when he was teaching at Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee, and living in the South for the first time. The book has become important to him ever since. Uh, Perrier studied at Catholic University of America, the Swedish Royal Academy, and earned MFA degree from Yale University, and is the recipient of numerous fellowships and awards, and his work is not only in major museums all over the country, but all over the world. His woodcuts for Kane are on two scales. The seven larger images are abstract portraits of women characters in the book. And you'll see from the titles that each one is named after a different woman in the book. The three smaller blocks, which I'm not showing you here, are reinterpretations of the enigmatic arcs that John Toomer, who was the uh, author of Kane, <coughs> placed on pages dividing sections of the first um, edition. A noted critic in his essay on Kane uh, shows how the book addresses the racial situation in the early 20th century. And here's another image from that. Um, in coming to grips with the present, Jean Toomer insisted on confronting the past and exploring the heritage of slavery to its very roots in ways that would both avoid both condescension and romantic romanticization. Looking about him, he sensed an agrarian folk culture deeply rooted in the slave experience. There was still time, he thought, to explore that culture, and indeed the very soul and spirit of the Black South, before urbanization and industrialization rendered it unrecognizable. The simplicity and directness, and eloquence and power of Perrier's forms and cane call on the power of the woodcut as one of the oldest means of visual communication. Now, John Buck, the third artist that I'd like to talk uh, about tonight, is both a sculptor and a printmaker. He works with two interrelated bodies of work, carved wood, assemblage, and bronze sculptures, and large multicolored woodblocks. And you can see from the dimensions here, they're really quite popular. Since beginning his collaboration with Bud Shark, uh, a printer, a professional printer in Colorado in 1983, uh, Buck has explored the expressive possibilities of woodblock in more than 40 different prints. Using a pen, a nail, or his fingernail, Buck incises the wood planks that form the base and background of his prints with images and symbols drawn from the daily news, from his own sculpture, and from nature, 
Embedded in this active visual, fe visual field is a large carved image, <coughs> often a figure, in this case an animal, um, <coughs> that is also depicted, uh, but he's also depicted a full jar of fireflies, an eagle, or a subtly colored mom. The relationship between these two elements that first engages the viewer in an appreciation of the beauty of the graphic quality in the print and then begins a conversation about our world and our place in it. Now, this is John Buck's newest print. Maybe some of you saw it recently at the New York Print Fair. It was on view there for the first time. This is called The Cat and a Jaguar walks past an array of mythological creatures, unaware of its fate as a threatened species. Uh, this is a very new woodcut as well, and it's called The Fountain. It's all about water. It features a large central image of a flowing fountain surrounded by a tapestry of incised images in the background. The incised images start at the top with happy mermaids, mermen, and fish frolicking in abundant water. Below, Buck presents scenes of water polluted by factories, oil wells, and fracking, and the resulting damage to our essential water supply. <coughs> in War Eagle, John Buck continues to explore what Eleanor Hartney, uh, writing in the uh, major catalog of his work, has described as, and I'm quoting her here, one of his overriding concerns, namely the conflict between our pastoral and utopian ideals and the sad reality of conflict, urbanization, power, militarism, end of quote. In this print, Buck focuses on conflicts and cultural upheaval in the Middle East. And I'm sorry that you can't see more of the details, but uh, if you go to Bud Shark's website, you can get really good um, close-ups of background. And finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, this work called The Luminary. The Luminary glows with light emanating from electric bulbs surrounding a silhou silhouetted central figure. The background is laced with an incised, fine line tapestry of images of Chicago, including historic moments in the city's history. Also depicted are the city's famous architecture, sporting teams, and rich arts and industrial heritage. The central figure illuminates these images and may be seen as a metaphor for inspiration and hope, which I think we all need a little bit of these days. So I did want to show you some very recent woodcuts, and I'd like to turn this over to Ingrid next for a little history of the woodcut. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Excuse me, could the speakers use the microphone because when the jets go over, we can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. It's not on? It's on. Oh, all right. Okay. So maybe I have to bring it over closer. I'm sorry. Thank you so much for being here at uh, Greenlands and everybody else. Thanks for inviting me. I thought, since we're dealing with Vanna Davis and this incredible output of uh, woodcuts, that we might explore why he was so influenced by the German Expressionists, how it came about, and then go back and see where the connection is. Over 500 years, the same approach, same look almost between a woodcut from the 1400s and a woodcut from the late 1800s <coughs> and early 1900s. Now let me get this system going here. Yep. Oh, okay, now. <coughs> start with the De Brugge, which means the bridge, and Werner Dreves, when De Brugge was founded in, in 1905, was exactly six years old. Um, the founders were the major artists, especially Kirchner, Schmidt, Kirchner, Schmidt, Rodloff, Heckel. They met in Dresden, and this was at a time in Europe where there was a transition. They were influenced by Edward Munch, 
by Gauguin, by Van Gogh, and uh, artists, but other artists from throughout Europe. But the way that they went about, and you can see that here, with this is the cover of Die Brücke, Kate Brücke, and this is Eric Hegel, who did this in 1910. By that time, they had moved to Berlin. The Brücke was founded in Dresden in 1905, um, which was a lovely Baroque city. They did not stay there long. They moved to Berlin in 1911, and by 1913, and Berlin attracted them because it was an industrial city, and there was nightlife, there was much more going on, whereas Dresden was charming, delightful, but off the beaten track. However, by the time Werner was 14, the Brücke dissolved. They invited uh, Edward Munch and Kandinsky to join, but they refused for some reason. Now, when Werner that found out Unfortunately, everything was interrupted. Wars have a way to be a watershed, and what went on before is interrupted, and then something new starts. So by the time World War I rolled around, 1914, the De Brugge had dissolved, and many of the artists went into the war and didn't come back. And Werner joined in 1917, and he took with him, um, oh, how was, what inspired De Brugge? That's pretty Nietzsche had something to do um, because they wanted to bridge, and I would like to quote this, and this goes back to the 1880s. Um, Nietzsche in Also Sprach said, what is great about man is that he is a bridge and not an end. What can be loved about man is that he is a transition, downfall, and failure. So, and um, so, and besides, there was a lovely bridge over the Elbe River in Dresden, and that inspired them as well. So, <coughs> Werner volunteered in 1917 for the, during the war, he took with him the poems of Walt Whitman and writings by Zarathustra. And when he returned, 1918, after the armistice in 1918, and was exposed th through the Bauhaus in Weimar, he, um, it, and here we go, um, he started, he recognized what the Brücke artists did, who by then had dispersed and were working independently. And he latched on for some reason, and here you have the windmill in the evening, done in 1919, which is one of his first woodcuts, and was later on used for a cover of another movement that was Return to Nature, called Wa Wandering Birds of Anderfelde, uh, of which he was a member, and this was a calendar for which he did the cover. And then, here we have an exhibition of the Bauhaus, that's already in 1923, by that time Werner had left, so we're jumping around a little bit. However, this is what I find very exciting. As the profits that were done by the Brücke artists, and back in the 15th century, Werner did a series after the war in 1919 called Getsemane or Ecke Homo. And that's a portfolio of 10 woodcuts, and you can see the, the directness, the coarseness, the way he handled the wood. And in a way, there is that bridge going back to the 1400s. Um, finishing up with Werner, this is one of his it's called Stars, a woodcut with hand coloring, um, his first abstraction done in 21, at which time he left Europe because he wanted to, to work with uh, painting. And um, so he traveled around the world and eventually ran into Kandinsky, but we'll get back. I want to go back to the, what is the woodcut and how did it come about? The woodcut as such has been around well before the uh, actual um, 
printing, what was needed was a medium. Before paper was invented, woodcuts were used to print textiles. And uh, it took Gutenberg in the 1450s to develop, but first it, it took paper. So paper came to Europe in the 13th century. And once you had that medium, you could use it to print on. And then it was used once Gutenberg developed the printing press for book illustration. So you will find today many books and out of the incunables, beautifully preserved paper. I refer to the Gutenberg Bible, the Library of Congress, one on vellum, one on paper, in pristine condition because of the cotton paper, the rag paper used. And so um, uh, you had, what, as a means, in order to prepare a woodcut in those days, it was understood. First of all, they were anonymous, they were very direct, they were primitive, and they required a lot of strength to cut through that wood, to get that groove, and carve out the sides. Um, and so the, um, the artists, we didn't know that, but they couldn't do it themselves. They had what they called a form schneider or a cutter of shapes, which would be the woodcut, cutting past the image, the drawing that was laid on the woodcut. And um, with the, um, uh, only with Dura did they start signing that, that era. Um, and those, <coughs> when you look at the woodcuts, the uh, apocalypse, you see the very fine lines and how much artistry and competence it required. <coughs> In between, how did woodcuts get around on paper? They were used, pilgrimages played a great role in that there were images and as the pilgrims moved from monastery to monastery, they took back with them an image, a souvenir, as we would use postcards today. And that's how the medium spread. Uh, the, um, Let's go back here. Uh, and this happened maybe in the monasteries because they, the guilds had developed and um, the, um, the woodcutters were not highly considered because, um, and that's why, it, why this medium was moved through the, the monasteries because they were considered on the same level as money forgers. And so, they had to establish themselves. So with that bridge from the very direct, primitive, almost explosive, as it started in the 15th century on paper, you move through history, half a millennium, into the late 19th century, you have Edward Wong with his woodcuts, using the plank, using the grain, and that was picked up by the group, the Brücke group in Dresden, transferred to Berlin where they made a, a great splash. Um, and as Werner returned to Europe after globe trotting, Latin, Italy, Spain, Latin America, St. Louis, and back to Dessau, there he met Kandinsky and that was very instrumental for him. And you see here, Kandinsky came from a slightly different uh, direction. Uh, you have um, lyrical color woodcut, which is from the sounds done in 1912. Kandinsky and music were very closely related. He illustrated and made woodcuts that replicated music as he heard it and wrote about that, uh, wrote about the spiritual in art around that time. Uh, both of them carried on very intensive correspondence until Kandinsky's death in 1944. Let's see. This is um, one of the early color woodcuts by Werner in 1938 uh, with some hand coloring. And uh, here we go back to the work at the beginning. Let me see, do I have more time? You didn't? Okay. No, gotta wrap up. Let's move on to the Done? next one. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Karen, your turn. <laughs> <laughs>
This was just in the Washington Post like a, a week ago, and I, I always laugh at the funnies. My husband thinks it's so funny that I'm laughing at the funnies. He doesn't think they're very funny. But this really just shows um, how the Bauhaus and abstract art still pervades our everyday lives. It's also my reminder not to be too verbose about a subject that they're passionate about, as we all are. <laughs> So, in 1910s, abstract art began to pop up in many sectors of the world. We did not really define it as a movement until the 1930s, a period of great unrest, warring and transitioning to extremist governments. At this point, this bold art was not going to go away. It was controversial. It was shocking. Druce captures this in the woodcut title, Trespassing that we've chosen for our portfolio. If you haven't seen, it will be on display later. But this is the print that we're talking about, trespassing. This is commemorating our American abstract artists. It's the title also used for our current show that we have running at the Washington Printmakers Gallery mentioned earlier, just a short walk away. I do want to invite anyone after this a reception that if you have not been over there, we will have that gallery open. If you're a night, a night owl, we can go over there and look at the show there. Uh, trespassing, in this case, is what abstract art was doing and still is. It's pushing the limits. It's changing definitions and going new places that we have not gone before, much like these children in this photograph. Yet despite its controversy, artists from around the world were obsessed to experiment with this new art. Suppression by their governments led many of them to flee. Gorky left Armenia. De Kooning left the Netherlands. Bolotowski left Russia. And Moholy Naj left Hungary. And Dravis left Germany. Many of these artists found their way to New York City. In the US in the 1930s, the depression weighed heavy. Jobs were limited, certainly for artists. Maybe this allowed them more time to create. At least now they had the freedom to choose what they created. For the first time, they were able to gather with like-minded open thinkers. FDR's first New Deal program, the Works Progress or Program Administration, that ran from 1930s to the mid-1940s helped immensely. Paychecks were minimal, but enough to help put food on the table. And these artists were openly encouraged to work together. They shared their ideas and techniques and created art for the public. Murals can still be appreciated in train stations, banks, office buildings, and markets today. The very first government commission project, though, was not in DC. Neither was it in New York City, but it was in San Francisco, here on Telegraph Hill in the Coit Tower in 1933. He who could find Mexican artists like Diego Riviera working alongside a Hasidic Jew like Bernard Sakim, where else but in America? Dreyfus was hired as a WPA artist, a supervisor teaching printmaking. Posters were big at this time. For They were gaining uh, support. Uh, they were posted to help gain support of the war effort. They also became a way for that everyday man to be exposed to art, art with the message. Stanley Hayter's Atelier 17 was another program that brought artists together to share techniques. He moved his workshop from Paris to New York City in 1940s where it remained for the another 10 years. Many great artists, I think you might have even generated this, it might look familiar to you, Joanne. <laughs> Many great artists benefited from this program, either through teaching or taking workshops from each other, including Becker, Calder, Chagall, Dali, Moreau, and Pollock. 
and Dreyfus at the Washington Printmakers Gallery, a series of seven abstract engravings from this period are on display. The Georgetown University, I believe, also has this collection in their, uh, also have these prints in their collection. In 1936, American abstract artists first convened under the mission to support each other's art without criticism and judgment. Albers, Schenker, and Dravis, both of those artists are illustrated in the Georgetown University show here today, uh, were a few of the many founding members. This group after 80 years is still going strong, as can be seen by their presence here today. Not only with James Gross here, but how many? Can you stand up those who are members of the American Abstract Art? because I think we have at least five of us. It's an honor to have you all here with us today celebrating this group. Many of these artisans disperse to pockets throughout the U.S. I will mention today just a few of the Bauhaus artists. Joseph and Annie Albers set up shop at Black Mountain College in the small town of Asheville. Today, this is part of the University of North Carolina. Here's some of his classic squares. Marguerite and Hans Wildenheim came uh, in the 1940s. She achieved the designation as the only female master potter in Germany at that time, only to be asked to leave afterwards due to her Jewish heritage. She set up at Pond Farm Pottery School in Sonoma County, California. Today this is a part of a state park and there's a current show on exhibit in the San Francisco International Airport for her work. Maholi Naj, a great influential Bauhaus teacher, set up the new Bauhaus, later transformed into the Chicago Institute of Design. For the first time, students could get a doctorate in the program of design. Travis uh, left New York City and moved to Washington University in St. Louis in 1946. Here he was surrounded by a strong German community and he taught the Bauhaus concepts with Max Beckman. Of all of our Bauhaus immigrants, Herbert Bayer, an Austrian who left Germany in 1937, most repre represented the concepts of the Bauhaus. He infiltrated art into large industry and spread the importance of the graphic layout and design in everything from logos, logos to advertisements to mass-produced products. Here he's shown with the World Geographic Atlas, the first atlas made post-World War II. He was really one of our first madmen. At the Aspen Institute in Aspen, Colorado, Bayer was given a full design freedom of a multiple acre site to create space, architecture, and even the furniture. Here we can see the strong influence of the Bauhaus lines, the color and the incorporation of nature for areas of contemplation. He brings modernism to the public space as well as to adhering to the importance of design in everyday objects. He is still finding time to create fine art in his weavings and his paintings. Craftsmanship indoctrinated in him during his Bauhaus years. How apropos that this site is still a meeting site for some of the strongest minds in the world to address world issues. Ultimately, what these extreme regimes of fascism, militarism, and Nazism tried to suppress ended up only in expanding and promoting not just abstract art, but also the sharing of abstract and new and fresh ideas that may just lead us to solutions of our world issues. There's always hope. <laughs> With that, I set the stage for James Gross.
seen a tooth. I lost a tooth yesterday on the Amtrak trip, so I try, try to keep my mouth closed away. And I apologize for that. I just want to say it's an honor to be here with Karen and my fellow artists in the group, the great painter Creighton Michael Kim. Very, very, from Florida. I won't tell them what you do in Florida on the side. She's a bartender. I just want to say 1936. Three groups were formed, the American Automobile Association, the American Abstract Artists, Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> I just came back from a local, local dive called the Tomb, around the corner. And I'm a member of two of those groups, but not the Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> I want to give you a little background on the Bauhaus. Bauhaus started on 1919, somewhere into the, 20, the first stage under Walter Gropius. It had a change. The leadership was under Johannes Itten. Itten was considered the, the leader of modern art education. But anyway, uh, along comes a great man, Werner Dreves, to study. What I, would, what I would give to go back in time and follow this, this man around and, and see him in his classroom with these incredible personalities. Itten, Feininger, Kandinsky, Laszlo Mahola Nagy, the whole group, Joseph Albers, what I would give to be in that room, to watch them interact. In 1965, I was in a show in Wichita, Kansas, I met Bolotowski. Right there, I fell in love with the movement when I got to meet Bolotowski. Uh, so anyway, the Bauhaus then, with a change of leadership and philosophy from Gropius to Laszlo Mola and Naj was a change in how, not politics, it's more of a how to teach art and craft. Because it really is a craft, fine art, uh, great machine we call the Bauhaus. And along comes in the second phase, Mr. Dravis. One more thing I want before I get to this. I had three of my students do this. They needed to improve their grade. I said, well, I have something for you here. I'm do, I want to knock out PowerPoint to take to DC. And you're just going to improve their grade a little bit when I get back to Kansas. <laughs> but I just want to say, uh, and off track here, as we come through all this, uh, Dravis is considered more, he was a great painter, but we know him for his woodcuts. But I just want to say one more thing. About 1958, when I was eight years old, I would go into a big square box on the plains of Kansas. We would go there because we had no air, but that, that little cube had ice cold air. It was called the Wichita Art Museum. In that museum, I would see Dravis's work on a cold Saturday morning. Mondrian drawing, Bolotowski oil, George L.K. Morris in the plains of Kansas. That museum is still there. The Whitney Museum built that collection. The new wing goes around that center, center core of the museum. But I remember that Werner Dravis, and my favorite work is the bats. I'm about ready to show you the bats. And so we go to through this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's not the bats, I just, the one guy who did this extra Hollywood production, his grade had just greatly improved. <laughs> when I get back to Kansas. There we go. But you can tell personalities in paintings and woodcuts. You know, it's, it's the area they take out of the plate, put the paint on, of course it's a relief, but you could almost read a personality of a great artist. I mean, the composition to me is just perfect in the negative space, positive, the whole thing. And of course, if you go to the Bauhaus, you will get great instruction. Again, what I would give to sneak in there as a mouse and hear Kandinsky talk to Mr. Jobs or hear Lionel Feininger. By the way, Wichita, Kansas is one of the great Feiningers in the world at our museum. Of course, the Bauhaus was a great 
great things, a great machine, a great machine for the study of art. Horace Hitler had no room for that, and it was closed in 32, I believe. Um, pretty soon I have five self-portraits by Mr. Jobs. I have these in order from the first to the last woodcut. Nineteen thirty, he became a U.S. citizen. If I'm right, Karen, is that right? Nineteen thirty-six. Or thirty-six. He came to America in thirty, a uh, citizen in nineteen thirty-six. The year the AAA was formed. Rockefeller Center. Times Square looks a little different today, doesn't it? It's our neon Hollywood. Walt Disney, but today we have, and what I would give if I could go back in time to, to visit with Mr. Drops, I think it would be a fun experience. I'm the last person that should be speaking about woodcuts. I am not a good woodcut artist. I've only done five in my life, and here I'm speaking of probably the greatest one in the world. But. Uh, but a sense of color, the composition, the placement of form, the negative, positive space, like music, it speaks to us. The, the message of music, the mystery of time and space, to me, he does it all so well. And in case, it seems like it's so simple for him to a natural composition. If I could plug in one more thing for Kansas, the well, Blue Rider group was also a Kansas, taught at KU, the Albert Block. Albert Block was, I believe, in Blue Rider, University of Kansas, where I went to school. And his wife just passed away, would not allow anyone in to see his work, was thrown in a closet in Lawrence, Kansas. When Albert Block died, they found the attorneys, let them enter. A treasure trove of masterworks in a closet in Lawrence, Kansas, behind a barn of Albert Block works, and also a few condensed <coughs> works stuck in that closet. And it's now in the courts when they settle that. This is my favorite work here. Of course, my students at the college really like this because they made this during Halloween, Karen. So they like that. <laughs> Also, I want to thank Karen for permission to arrive at these pictures from her website. I did not ask her permission. I just wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> hope I'm not in legal trouble here. I'm going back on Amtrak. So you know where to find you. You know where to find me. I was thinking Alfred Hitchcock, the birds. Oh, see this again. Let me see this. <laughs> So people, I want you to all go home tonight. Next week, I want you to make a woodcut. Just go sit behind a tree and do a woodcut. It's good for you. Just go and think of Mr. Drawbus here. This is a nice balance of forms, uh, working its way through space, the upper, lower, and then the, the way it's, it's an un, unto me an unusual composition. It's a great one. Here you see some of the influence of Lionel finding her composition. Let me come to his last few woodcuts here before his passing, I believe, in 1985, rest in Virginia. The 
those three young men are characters in my class. I think they're on the football team and they're great. Need a little help, so they'll be rewarded here. So, I, hope, I hope you like what you're doing. And that is his trademark, right? It is. Or, uh -huh. Can you tell me if he can it, see? It, it certainly predates the peace sign that we all think of. And, uh, it, uh, the earliest work I found with that symbol was dates to 1990. Okay. Now, the actual peace sign didn't come until about the 1950s, and that represented a conference that was being done on um, disarmament. So it's rather apropos that somehow he predates all that with this symbol. Uh, now, it, it goes back even further to what its potential meaning could be, but as it was explained to us, it actually just had his initials in it as well, so it spoke to him. Okay, well, thank you very much for allowing us. who was uh, later declared a national treasure in Japan. I was living in Japan uh, as a young woman, and uh, I used to send out homemade Christmas cards. And so when I was there, in addition to my husband and myself collecting Japanese prints, I thought, well, I'd like to know how to make a little Christmas card with a Japanese technique. So a friend said, well, there's this very nice artist who takes students in his home. His name is Anichi Hiratsuka. Just call him up and you can go over there. So I did and it was really quite an experience because neither Mr. Hiratsuka or Mrs. Hiratsuka spoke any English <laughs> and I didn't speak such great Japanese having been there maybe a year and a half and also had a baby in the meantime. <clears throat> but he was very gracious and welcomed me into his home Mrs. Horatska made tea, and uh, you know, uh, art is a visual language, so he could actually physically show me how to copy a drawing, and uh, trace it onto a block, and then gradually ex explain to me how we needed a different block for each color in the Japanese woodcut. Um, I don't know where that came from, I just wanted, hmm, oh well. We want to go, I think I had my hand on there in the wrong place. Can we go back? There we go, okay. So, uh, well, uh, not too long after having worked with Mr. Horatska, uh, I came back to America, and it was like 10 years later before I took another course in woodcut. I didn't really feel inspired to work in the Japanese technique. Something about the, the way it was handled, the, very small amounts of color in different spots uh, didn't appeal to me as an artist. So having also uh, almost accidentally found a teacher such as Carol Summers, another really great artist, was quite a, uh, an amazing event. Um, now, there was a tie-in between Horatska and Summers in the fact that both of them used the Japanese uh, rice paper for their work. And um, Japanese rice paper, of course, is handmade. And uh, <clears throat> one of the benefits of it, at least according to Carol Summers, is that it's translucent, that you have something under it, you can sort of see it through it. And it's also extremely durable. Uh, it'll probably last longer than any of us sitting here. It's, it's just amazing. <laughs> Uh, the other thing that, uh, second thing that's very similar is um, the use of the hand press alone. Like the Japanese prince never used a press and neither did Carol Summers. So he taught his students 
to use hand pressure only with a little bar end which you rubbed mm -hmm. to make the pressure on the paint come through. And then um, the third thing that I learned from Carol Summers, aside from his inspiration, <coughs> was um, to make limited edition of prints. In other words, you made a print in order to make reproductions of it. It was not a monoprint, which came about later. And to make a limited edition and to number the number of prints that you made. So he taught me to make editions of 50. So, you know, I did that. That was what you did. Uh, now, from there on, uh, I've discovered that Carol Summers had a completely revolutionary, different way of handling the print and handling the woodcut. And I think you can see in this uh, particular, let me see, where's this little thing? the gadget that gives me the pointer. Sorry, Kristen. Somebody took it. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, no. Oh, here. Is this it? Oh, okay. Great. Um, <laughs> Carol Summers uh, used uh, texture by putting a, uh, a piece of uh, plywood that had a very prominent uh, ridge on it and then putting the paper over it and then rubbing, a, uh, taking a roller lightly ink and going over it so that you got an impression of the wood beneath. Sort of like if you were a kid and you put a piece of paper over a penny and rubbed, you got the image on the print on the penny. Well, this is what happened. That's how we got this texture here. And then here you have a texture which was the actual block that was printed there. That was that texture. Then the, the moon up here is also a texture. Now the other things that are on here, some of them were relief printing, but some of them were hand done. In other words, not, not like a painting, because it's not a painting, but done with a roller. And a roller was very lightly inked and with a control, which is difficult to learn, you were able, I was able to ink this area. And uh, I think the red area was inked in. So that many of these areas were not actually uh, from a relief print. Hope I'm not getting too technical here. Um, then what what Carol Summers did was he took a, a bar salt, which is a mineral spirit, and sprayed it on the ink, which was put on with a roller, thinly put on. And what happened was that the ink would dissolve into the paper and in some cases flow. So you had the flowing ink and what happened was that you had a very great intensification of color when it was sprayed. It was something about the color and solution was brighter than if you just used the straight ink. So that was a very interesting technique that he employed and taught his students. So you had the roller, the spray, and the rubbing. And then also Carol Summers <laughs> printed on both sides of the paper. There's some prints, like if I go to the next print, which is, help. <laughs> Where's my next print? There you go. Road to Vermont. Oh. <clears throat> this area here is uh, actually uh, printed on the, with the wood beneath it, and then sprayed so that when you spray it, the ink melts or flows into between where the, where the other ink has dried, if you follow me. Up here, the ink has dried and the blue is, is put on behind. So that was something that I don't know that anybody's ever done, and I don't know if anybody still does. But he was very innovative in how he did that. Now, what were the advantages of using these freer techniques of his? Uh, I would say that it was more a direct expression of emotion in the work. And I don't know if you can feel that way, but uh, the artist's feeling goes into the work and hopefully when the person views it, they can understand or take up that feeling. Um, that particular print is in the exhibition in the hallway, so you might take a look and you'll see that the actual print looks quite different than the photographic image. And also, I noticed that Lulin has taken a photograph of the back of that print and put it up there. 
so that you can see both sides. That's actually Kristen's wall. Kristen, Kristen that? did that Thank whole you, Kristen. wall. Great. It's wonderful. So then you can ask yourself, well, where did this idea of spraying and the flowing of ink come from? And then it makes you think of Helen Frankenthaler, who was and is, was and is, a, did she pass away recently? Uh, a wonderful New York abstract expressionist artist. And uh, she, in fact, her painting, Mountains and the Sea, is here in the National Gallery. Maybe you've all seen it. But she poured liquid paint onto the canvas, which was unprimed, so that the ink soaked into the canvas. And then she let it flow. And so you have this wonderful freedom of the ink sort of expressing maybe the freedom, <coughs> all kinds of other kinds of freedoms that people were interested in producing. Uh, it, the, there was a very famous critic called Clement Greenberg who was acquainted with her and promoted her work. He also introduced two Washington artists, Ken Nolan and Morris Lewis, to Frankenthaler. He invited them to visit her studio in New York. They were completely <coughs> blown away, as the expression goes, by her technique of pouring and letting the ink flow. So five years later, they came back to Washington, or they came back sooner, but they picked it up and they started what's called the Washington Color School. So that is the scene when I, when I came into the, well, when I came back to Washington and started working, and uh, I got to know some of the, uh, the Color School artists. And uh, that did affect how I handled my work, but this is an earlier piece. Uh, the one that I showed you first, it was called Ixlan, was commissioned by Associated American Artists in New York, which is the print gallery. And that's another triple A. We had three triple A's, right? <laughs> uh, they commissioned the, the Ixlan, the first slide I showed you. They commissioned an edition of 100. And so when I look at that and I think of all the handwork <coughs> and how I was wielding the roller and how I was spraying the stuff, I don't see how I did it. You know, I really don't. I have to take it my hat off to my kids, <laughs> putting off with putting up with a mother who spent all her time doing things like that. <laughs> so anyway, uh, getting back to the Washington Color School, uh, I was back in Washington in the Corcoran Museum here, which regrettably was closed. I think it was a national disgrace myself. But anyway, they promoted Washington artists. And we got to see a lot of these wonderful color school artists in, in the portrait. Jean Davis, who was having a show which is opening <coughs> for Joanne at the National Museum of American Art right now. So you all must go and see it. But Jane, Jean Davis is famous for these huge paintings which are rows of vertical stripes. They're all exactly the same width. like one inch or a half inch wide. And then their colors are the only variation. It's just the, the form is always the same. And they're really stunning. You know, when you look at them, the colors just vibrate. But when I was looking at them in those days, I kept thinking, that is all of these color artists. They're always using vertical forms and V's and things like that, I said. And being a feminist, I thought, why don't they use round forms, you know? I mean, what's wrong with round forms? Aren't they just as interesting to work with in color? So now, whoops. abstract 
here you're taking shapes and making them look like a landscape. And uh, this reminded me of the Nile. It's called a <coughs> tomb, but that's supposed to be the Nile. And that's a, obviously a pyramid. And this is a palm tree, which has its roots going down into the underground water. And this whole area that here symbolizes the unconscious, where all your energy and strength is supposed to be comes from. So it's flowing up into that tree. So I like to think of sort of, you know, Jungian concepts and archetypes and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I would like to close with a quote from Clement Greenberg, which I thought was interesting. He said that without an appreciative audience, um, art is like a tree falling in a forest. You think about that for a minute. It's kind of scary, isn't it? He believed that art's highest purpose was to agitate the human spirit at an ex wait a minute, at an experiential level. Experiential level, whatever that is. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, profound for words that an artist of genius was in touch with universal truths of his era. This is from a book called Clement Greenberg, The Life. So think about that, you know, what are the universal truths that are being expressed by these abstract artists? So that gives you all something to go home and think about tonight. Thank you very much. But after the exhibition closes, you can make an appointment at the Smithsonian American Art Museum to see his prints in the study room. We have an almost complete collection, thanks to the Dravis family, and they're there, they're on our website. So if you ever are interested in seeing them up close and personal, you are cordially invited. And the same can be said here as well. That we, we love to have uh, researchers and members of the public to come and look at the collection here too. So you've got lots of options. We, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say too, we do have a, a, after our reception this evening, uh, if anyone hasn't had the chance to go to the Washington Printmakers Club, we'll, we can open it. I know some of you are going um, back to your homes uh, away from D.C., so we want to give you that opportunity. Where, where is it? Um, we have a little postcard. It's like literally, how many blocks from here, Mike? It's two blocks one way and two blocks up. Yeah, very That's close. And some of us are driving over, so you can catch a ride with one of us. Mulan? Ingrid. I'd like to know more about the American Abstract Artist School. <coughs> I haven't followed it since 1937, and I'm <laughs> that it is still around. Yeah. How many members? And oh, Creighton. How Creighton. do you go yeah. about Creighton. 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 the Creighton. podium and right. tell us? Uh, well, we actually have some material at the gallery. Yeah. And uh, there's a one of the uh, publications, the most recent. Uh, the fourth portfolio, the 75th anniversary portfolio uh, catalog is at the gallery. And you can see the images there. We also have a website which was, the, it was used partially. But if you go to American Abstract Artist, um, Google American Abstract Artist, it will come up. You can see what we're doing, what we have been doing, and uh, hopefully at some point what we will be doing. How many members? And how many how members? Yes, and what happened during the war? And did you reconstitute yourselves? I, mean, I, uh, I haven't heard of that group at all. They had, it, is, it, has, uh, it has gone, it, 
uh, has continued um, it's pretty much unbroken for the last 80 something years without um, there's about a hundred members or 90, 90 plus members um, there we don't have a brick and mortar facility never have uh, the new president gets boxes of, of archival materials <laughs> and responsibilities. Uh, James has helped uh, helped us with, uh, with some archival material. He's been he seemed to have has, has gathered quite a bit of material over the years, and is now giving it to us. We just um, met with the Whitney a few weeks ago. They acquired their fourth portfolio. They have now all four portfolios, as does the um, Modern, as does, does the Metropolitan Museum in New York. The Phillips Collection here has three of the four. And um, anyway, the, the library at the Whitney Museum is also going to function as a place that will work with us to uh, maintain an archive. And we're bringing materials from James to, to that library. But thank you. I felt very ignorant. If I could just say, in those days, American artists were mad. No one would show their work. Museum of Modern Art wouldn't show it. Whitney wouldn't show it. The Met would even touch it. So Harry Holtzman loads up his station wagon with abstract artists and drives it up and down Fifth Avenue. That, that was really the first abstract show in America. The AAA was formed after that trip when the Morris and Les Sal and the others formed a group in 36, Mr. Dravos was there. But the museums would not show abstract painting. If it's Juan Moreau or some of the others, Mondrian, Bellatosi, they would. But American painters did not really have uh, a reason to put up in a museum, the Whitney and so forth. So there was a group formed to promote abstraction in the 1930s. Yeah, it was actually a protest. A Probably protest for modern yeah. art that, that started. And in those days, Mondrian couldn't even pay the dues. They, they, someone would pay his dues. Fernand Leger, someone paid his dues. They were all poor. All these artists were poor. And uh, Joseph Alberts uh, was an early member of the group. Did Dreyfus do his own uh, printing, or did he get a printer to Oh, no. He's, um, he did all his own. So he did uh, mostly woodcuts, uh, and they were all done in his studio. And that was the why he uh, liked doing woodcuts, but for a couple reasons. He liked the texture and all that, but he could do it without <coughs> using the press. Now, he does have, um, and you'll see in his catalog resume, he does have several um, runs of intaglios and different, you know, copper copper engravings, you know, different methods that he did. In those cases, he did use a press in different areas, um, not out of the home. But he wasn't um, using a, a But press. he would he would physically do all the printing himself. And it was, but it was, it was uh, oil-based, wasn't it? For, uh, for the woodcuts he had, would uh, he used blo uh, block ink. Right. Was but oil -based. it wasn't, you know, It wasn't the Japanese watercolor. Yeah. Well, yeah. There was one, Landscape, and I think you showed it there. That was looked like a Bokashi sort of yeah. effect, you know. But it was ink; it was not mm -hmm. was not water based. Yeah, no. I, he would use the Japanese papers, but he, he um, also we have a video playing on the on the monitor in the reception room that is showing Werner Dravis in his studio oh. printing. And thanks to Karen who provided that for us. Mm -hmm. Now what's neat, if, uh, at the Washington Printmaker Gallery right now on the back wall, we do have a bunch that he did while he was teaching for Atelier 17. And those are in Taglio process because they have the, they have the print press right there. May I expand? May I expand? May I expand on that? Dravis, the fact that cutting the block required real physical effort and it was a relax. First of all, he was very strong. And uh, that gave him an opportunity to think, that physical effort. And many of his woodcuts, the ideas were used either in collages or watercolors or paintings. So it was like taking a break from creating and exerting himself physically. Uh, so and, well, in a way, yes, in a way, and he inked, 
and he used to bend them. Sometimes he, you can use a spoon, you know, anything that's swallowed and bent. And it does require tremendous effort. But using Japanese papers, of course, they're soft sized, and so they absorb the, the paper beautifully. It was a challenge for him. Um, I knew Werner when he lived in Reston. I knew him and his wife there. We actually swapped prints, which was an honor. And it was interesting to me that he had um, piles of magazine cutouts of areas of color things, and then he would make a uh, collage with the color, and that was uh, a kind of preparatory method, so he would know where he wanted to put color, and what color, and what shapes. Uh, so he had a real process, and um, he was a wonderful, wonderful gentleman. And he, when I moved to New York, he came and visited uh, and had dinner in my apartment uh, overlooking <coughs> the uh, East River. And his wife said after the visit that he had made a print based on the view from the East River, but I never saw the print. I don't know if it was the one that you showed. It could have been 1982. It could have very likely been 1982. Well, they actually lived, um, in the 30s, they lived along the, the East River in a tenement housing. Uh, and there are some wonderful uh, earlier woodcuts from that time. We can take a look at the catalog race I, and I we'll pull those off. Yeah. What was your name? Uh, my name is Joan Root, R-O-O-T. Oh, gotcha. yeah. And Joan is a wonderful artist herself. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't know if we have any more time. Should we? We don't have any time. We have a wonderful reception. <laughs> <laughs> so we want you all to enjoy something. Thank you. you have all brought to us a wonderful panel. The panel has brought to us a beautiful visual display of prints and prints from woodcuts. And what you have all brought to this library is the 21st century version, not just of the woodcut being alive and well, but the 21st century version of the 19th century art salon. So for that, we thank you all for this intimate glimpse into wonderful work. And thank you all, what members of the Washington Print Club, the Washington Printmakers Gallery, and of course, members of the Georgetown Library Associates who are here this evening. This has been a lovely evening. We invite you to a look at the color, color and relief exhibition that Len and Kristen have so carefully curated, and of course to enjoy a reception. Thank you all for coming, and thank you, panel. Warm. Thank you.